As we return to our seats today, we're going to enter into our time to hear and respond to a message from God's Word. In particular, today, we're going to be picking up where we left off a couple of weeks ago in the Sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. In particular, for our purpose today, we're going to be turning to Matthew 5, verses 38 through 42. But before we turn there, I have a couple of disclosures I would like to make. This will be a two-part message. That's the first disclosure. Because there's just so much here, these five verses in Jesus' sermon, that we, we would not be able to cover it all in one day. So this will be a two-part message. The second is, I have a question for us all. I would like a show of hands. Who has ever heard the phrase, two wrongs don't make a right? Maybe a better question would be, who has never heard the phrase, two wrongs don't make a right? There, there's, there's a couple. There's a couple. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that bravery to lift up your hand. You know, it's a popular phrase in our culture. And I want to ask, do you know what does? What makes a right? Three lefts. Three lefts make a right. That may have not been the best way to start off our time to hear and respond to a message from God's word, but I stand by it because it has a great connection to what it is we're going to be discussing today as we continue our sermon series over the Sermon on the Mount that we've been doing this year. At this point, in the Sermon of Sermons that Jesus gives us, he has explored many radical things. He has spoken to us many just, just countercultural things. The, the Beatitudes were not enough. These six I say to you sayings of Jesus, the second part that we've been digging into and digging through themselves, show us that his way is radically different than this world's way. That his kingdom is radically different and the people in it are different because we choose to live in a different manner. A truly peculiar manner from the perspective of those of this world. And a big challenge in this that we cannot afford to miss. We can't miss this. It's the whole reason I fully believe God is leading us through the Spirit in this sermon of sermons that Jesus gave so long ago. Is we have to ask, do our lives resemble such a radically different way of life in this world that others take notice and their curiosity is provoked regarding why? Do our lives resemble such a radically different way of life that this world, in this world that others take notice and their curiosity is perked regarding why? Because this is the point. This is the point of Jesus' teaching. He's trying to show us the way, the better way, how to live in the truth, his truth, the only truth, so that we can receive the life. The only life that there is that's everlasting to everlasting. It is meant to change the way we live. It is meant to show us how it is truly that we can have that righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, which is something that Jesus addresses here, which we've talked about was a pseudo-righteousness, a fake righteousness that wasn't a righteousness at all. And how God calls us to his righteousness, as Peter would tell us, to be holy as he is holy. As the Old Testament would tell us in the law of Moses, to be holy as he is holy. That we are to be holy as God is holy in a righteous living before others, God, and the whole creation and with ourselves. Understanding that righteous living is simply having a right relationship. A right relationship with God, ourselves, others in the whole of creation. All the more reason for us to heed the words of Jesus. All the more reason to see what it is he has to teach us about just this. Because in particular, Jesus here in this section of the sermon is dealing with how it is that we relate to others. In these six I say to you statements of Jesus, he's directly dealing with how we would have a right relationship with others. And so far, we've explored four of these statements. We've gone through four of them, and today we're going to be journeying into the fifth. In particular, how it is that we deal with someone when they have wronged us. 
when we've been personally offended by them, when we find ourselves at, odd with another, at odds with another. And as we open to this fifth ethical teaching, this I say to you statement of Jesus in Matthew 5, 38 through 42, we must be reminded and warned. Up to this point, Jesus' teachings here in the Sermon on the Mount have not only been radically different than what the world would teach us, they have been extremely difficult to accept. I don't know about you, but there's times where I read this, I'm like, oh, that's hard. How do you do that? In fact, one writer put it best. He put, if it were not from him, we would be prone to dismiss it as coming from some out-of-touch visionary who did not really understand the human predicament. It is not the case, though, in what we've been taught in this sermon, because it comes from Jesus. This comes from Jesus. And that's the big thing is when we, he says, I say to you, we have to ask the question, who is Jesus to you? Because that will be the determining factor of whether Jesus has anything to say to you. Because if he's not God, if he's not your Lord, he has nothing to say to you. You might as well dismiss everything we've discussed this past year. But if he is God, if he is Lord, if he is God in the flesh, he has everything to say to us. And we must heed what he has to say to us and listen to it. We must listen to it. Lord Jesus, as you speak to us today, by your word, in your word, help us to understand this is coming from you, our Lord. This is your very word and your very teaching on how it is that we are to live and interact with one another. Soften our hearts to what it is you will have in store for us today. Help us to receive it fully, Lord, and be changed by it. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let us now turn to Matthew 5, 38 through 42, and see what it is the Lord has to say to us today, especially in regards to our inner desire for vengeance, for retaliation, for retribution. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Jesus here does what he does in all of these I say to you sayings. He first begins by capturing the fullness of what the law would prescribe, what the law would say. And he does this in verse 38. He perfectly captures for us the Old Testament tradition and teaching. It is actually, once again, like the former statements he has made, an exact quotation of the law of Moses. In particular, Exodus 21, 23 through 25, regarding legal disputes where there is actually a loss at stake. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, strike for strike. And then Leviticus 24, 19 through 20, if anyone injures his neighbor as he has done it, shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. And then there is Deuteronomy 19.21. Your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. And it's essential for us to refer to all these instances that Jesus is referring to here. Because this wasn't just something that they just taught happenstancely in their culture. It wasn't something that they taught just every once in a while. This was ran through the fabric of the law of Moses. This was the expected behavior and the expected outcome of the judicial systems in Israel at this time. It wasn't a happenstance law, but it was woven through the fabric of their law. And it wasn't just a biblical law either. In fact, it is believed that this was a law that was perpetuated throughout the world, actually. There was a, a tablet they found called the Law of Hambri. I totally just butchered that. Hammerabai. Hammerabai. 
that was believed to be discovered, like date, dated to about the 1800s, the 18th BC, sometime around there, 1800 BC. And it's become known as something in Latin as the Lex Talanias, or in English, the Law of Retaliation. Now, some would look at this eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and be like, gosh, that's really brutal. When you think about it, that's kind of brutal. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. I mean, accidents happen, don't they? Mistakes happen. Yes, they do. But this was not a law of brutality. It actually was a law given of great mercy. Because I don't know about you, but I know about me. I tend to demand more back when I feel wrong than what was wrong to me. We tend to do that in our society. We tend to not do foot for foot, rather we do foot for a pinky toe. We tend to escalate things. We tend to demand more back for retribution than what we had been wronged by. I think about when ashamedly myself and a bunch of my friends in our college dorm would engage in prank wars. Every, it would always start off as something really small and innocent and then it would just escalate a little bit and escalate a little bit more until someone leans a trash can full of water on someone's door and it pours out unexpectedly into their room and ruins a $2,000 laptop that was sitting on their floor. The thing is, we have a way of escalating things. We have a way of taking things to the next level. Well, if they do that, I'm going to do this. And it's going to be far worse because I'm going to get my pound of flesh back. Because in our sinful nature, we need the law of retaliation. We need this law to keep us from taking it to that next level, from taking back more than what was taken from us. Because when we seek retaliation, retribution, and vengeance for ourselves, when we have been wronged, we tend to go a little bit overboard. This is also why in Deuteronomy we see that this is not up for individuals to determine. These laws written throughout the Old Testament in the law of Moses was not up to an individual to determine. They weren't the ones that got to decide which tooth they got to take. They weren't even the ones that got to decide if they could take a tooth. It was part of their judicial system. It was in the very fabric of their judicial system. So they would go before the judges that Moses would appoint, and those judges would determine, well, the tooth you lost was already falling out, so you're not going to take that other guy's tooth. They had a way of even further di di distinguishing about what would be a proper judgment and what wouldn't be a proper judgment. If you lost a bad tooth, then you could take a bad tooth, but you couldn't take a good tooth. And we see this in that thing we referenced a couple weeks ago called the Mishnah, which was the teaching of the rabbis. You know, the thing is, though, with no other system to render reparation for wrongs committed, this was a foundational understanding of how justice could be brought to conflict and wrongs done by individuals towards others. And you want to know what? This is kind of the basis of our judicial system, too, when you really think about it. We want a fair and just punishment with fair and just reparations for wrongs committed. And it's not just our culture, but cultures and societies worldwide use this law of retaliation, whether they want to admit it or not. And I say all this to explain what's wrong with it then. You've heard it said, Jesus says, but I say to you, Jesus, what's wrong with this? It's, it's part of the law of Moses as all these other things you've talked about. What's necessarily innately wrong with this? Do we not want justice when there's wrong? Anything less than that would be injustice, and that would be wrong. I don't think there is much we could say is intrinsically wrong about this teaching. Intrinsically wrong. I cannot talk today. There is, there's not much that is intrinsically wrong about this, this law, this law of retaliation, lex to lioness, which is known by many as the oldest law in the books. So what's wrong with it? This is where Jesus shows us the heart. Boy, we were good at following the letter. And that's what the Pharisees could do. They could follow the letter of the law. They could follow this to a T. It was simple to follow. But Jesus is trying to return us to the heart, the reason the law was needed, that deeper heart issue that goes beyond the letter. And it's in the first part of verse 39 where Jesus says, But I say to you, 
Do not resist the one who is evil. What do you mean by that? This is something that's been debated over the course of centuries. What is Jesus actually saying here? In fact, many have a visceral reaction to Jesus' teaching here. Because by and large, we don't fully understand what it is that Jesus is actually teaching us here. And for many, they have been divided on the subject. There are those who believe that Jesus here teaches non-resistance. One commentator best explained this through the telling of Leo's whole story. story. The famed Russian novelist known for war and peace, who also wrote a book called What I Believe. He wrote this. Tells how in an instant time of soul searching, he read and reread the Sermon on the Mount. And then in one life-changing moment, came to understand that Christ meant exactly what he said in his command, do not resist the one who is evil. On the basis of this understanding, he came to believe that no Christian should be involved in the army, the police force, or the courts of law. Christ's way, he argued, is to not resist evil in any way. And he said that teaching is absolute and unconditional. He would take on the life of a path, a, a path of Yes, that. Um, I am so sorry. And in fact, you know, I consider myself a pacifist. Pacifist. Pacifist, pacifist. I, oof. But I don't use this verse to justify it, because I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about here. That's not what Jesus is getting at here. In fact, there are some people that would argue, but we need certain things. Or there would be no justice. There needs to be the ability to resist that which is evil in this world, and we should. And they take it, the argument, the completely other way. And I say this to show that we're divided on this. But I also say this to explain that that's not what Jesus is getting at here. We can't just read the first part of this verse, verse 39, and say, okay, we understand what Jesus is saying. We have to read what comes next. Because it's what comes next that Jesus explains to us exactly what he means when he says, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. He has more to say. He has more to show us about what it actually means. And Jesus is going to show us and try to teach us where our hearts should be. And if our hearts are in the right place, we need no such thing as the law of retaliation. We can do away with the law of retaliation because we can live in a much better way. And we can live a life of forgiveness. Just like he lived a life of forgiveness towards us. That we would relinquish our presupposed rights to such things as retaliation, retribution, and vengeance for the sake of our witness in who Christ is and what Christ has done for us regarding such things. Trusting that ultimately all things are in his hands and he has already taken care of it. You know, we're going to get to a verse here in a second where he says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It's God's. It's not up to us. Be not mistaken with this, though. What Jesus has to say here to us is for all of us. And if we indeed wish to walk in a manner worthy of our calling and to achieve a righteousness that supersedes that of the scribes and Pharisees, we must heed and choose to surrender our life by what Jesus has to say. And it's here where Jesus will continue on his teaching regarding retaliation by giving us four real-world, with practical application examples of how it is we actually do this, to show us how it is to do this. However, this being a two-part message today, we're only going to be able to get through two of them today, and we'll be looking at the other two next week. Verse 39 continues when he says, But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, to then say first. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now understand, we cannot read verse 39 in parts. We have to read it as a whole. Just like we can't read these other examples that Jesus is giving us without this first part of verse 39. Each one of these examples turns back to the beginning there to not resist the one, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So we're going to be going back to that first part of 39 quite a bit here because it is the 
context, a pretext to help us understand the examples that Jesus gives us. This first statement of Jesus' teaching is dripping with significant meaning that we often miss in our culture. But if someone slaps you on the right cheek, if you would be physically assaulted, and that's not just what Jesus is talking about, I would always take it as a physical assault, but it could also be a verbal assault, especially by how he words this. For example, he's very specific with his wording here. He mentions the right cheek. Well, what's it about the right cheek? Why is Jesus being so specific with his wording? We know that Jesus doesn't say anything by happenstance. We know that Jesus didn't teach anything just willy-nilly. Just like, he didn't go, well, if someone slapped, well, let me think about this. Left, right, left. The right cheek, the right cheek, then turn the other. There's a point to this. And we cannot forget Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Once again, Jesus didn't speak this willy-nilly. He said the right cheek for a reason. Jesus is being very intentional with his words here. Does anybody know why he says the right cheek? We. We, you're nailing it. Um, so I, I need a couple of volunteers. <laughs> they get the, I, 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 mom, you come on up here. Come on up here, Mom. So the thing is, most people in this time period were right-handed. They were not left-handed. And I just want to ask you, is it easy to smack someone on the right cheek with your um, right hand? Because if you're going to smack someone, you're going to smack them with your dominant hand. It takes a backhanded slap. It takes, as Lee was showing us, a backhanded slap with the right hand to strike someone on the right cheek. I would like you to slap me with your right hand on my right cheek without using the back of your hand. You don't have to. It's okay. I deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, there wasn't a lot of power behind that. There could have been, but it takes a lot of effort. You've got to turn your arm like this, and you've got to make a lot of extra effort where if you just go whack. The point is, Jesus was explaining that this was going to be a backhanded slap. Lee, you, you nailed it, that it would contain with it a deep sense of insult to it. According to the rabbinic law, to hit someone with the back of the hand was twice as insulting as hitting him with the flat of your hand. The back of the hand meant calculated contempt, withering disdain. It meant that we were scorned as inconsequential, as nothing. So if you really wanted to insult someone, you smack them with the back of your hand. Jesus chooses his words very carefully here, purposely. Because even in our society today, there's some carryover with this thought. To slap someone just to slap them across the cheek, it can be demeaning. But to actually use the back of your hand, whether it was your left or right hand, it didn't matter. If it was the back of your hand, it would cause a greater insult. And we've got to ask, how would you respond? How would I respond if someone would do that to me today? I can tell you what I was taught to do as a child. Hit him back! Not, not by you, Mom but by many other people. <laughs> I was taught by many of my male mentors early in my life that's how you should respond if someone would hit you. And I know that my blood would be boiling inside of me. I know my initial reaction to a physical attack would be to break out those black belt skills I learned as a child and that I perfected in the army as a man. Even a deeply cutting verbal insult, I know what my initial reaction would be. Therefore, I must check myself. I must take a second to pause and check myself. Because my initial reaction would be to practice lex talionis, the law of retaliation, and respond to insult with insult. And isn't that our natural inclination as sinful people? It is. But there is something about that. There is something about that, our old sinful nature, 
that the Bible is trying to teach us about here, that Jesus is trying to teach us about here. That is not who we are anymore. That is not who we're supposed to be anymore. Jesus is getting us back to the heart of how it is we should relate to another, even when we have been deeply wrong. I think what Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, regarding this teaching of Jesus here, who we were before is dead. We are now new, born again in him. We've left the ignorances and evils of that former life to take on Jesus' way of life. Jesus, therefore, here is saying, when wrong, even when deeply insulted, do not go to the law about it. Do not go to Lex Helianus about it. Rather, show yourself to be a true disciple in how you choose to bear the ridicule, the contempt, and the insults that come your way. You have no need for the law of retaliation. Rather, you can, as Paul would say, overcome evil with good by forgiving the injustice done to you by trusting that God has it in hand. More on that in just a little bit. You know, we could always return insult for insult. We can always repay wrong with more wrong. We can always try to fight fire with fire and get nowhere. Or we could rather choose to do what Jesus has done for us. Which is to take it and to offer back forgiveness. Because that is what he's done for us. Aren't we all grateful that Jesus hasn't practiced Lex Talionis with us? That law of retaliation? For each and every one of us are responsible for that cross that he hung upon. And instead of retaliating upon that cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. It means throwing away our right that we think we have for retaliation, for retribution and vengeance, and choosing to not return wrong for wrong, but rather to live out that golden rule that we will eventually get to, probably sometime in the late fall in Matthew 7, 12, that says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, also do to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Do to others as you would have them do to you. This is the total opposite of what our culture teaches, even though that's a famed culture saying, we call it the golden rule. But who in our society actually lives by it? Who in our society actually radically, the way that Jesus is telling us to do this, actually does that? We can't do that without Jesus. Because without Jesus, we have no example. Without Jesus, we have nothing to look to to say, wow, God did that for me. I need to do that for others. It's totally opposite to even what I was taught as a child. Have you ever heard that schoolyard phrase, I am rubber and you are glue. Whatever you throw at me bounces off me and sticks on you. That's what I was taught to say. Let me just tell you, that just gets you punched in the face again. Um, And you know, such things like that in themselves still contain that element of that law of retaliation. Jesus calls us to put all such things away and seek a better way. Instead of vengeance, love. Bringing us to the second of these four examples that Jesus gives us on how to actually live this, how to actually do this. And I want to return back to verse 39. Because we know that all these things come from a place of evil. They come from a place of sin. And that's what Jesus is trying to show us. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Do not resist the one who is acting out in evil. But, and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, in verse 40, let him have your cloak as well. Jesus is moving beyond insult here. Jesus is moving beyond injury here. Jesus now is having us imagine a scenario in which someone would sue the very shirt off our back. Have you ever heard that phrase? They'll sue this shirt off your back. In this time period, you could actually do that. You could take someone to the cleaners, literally, and take everything they had, including the shirt off their back. But there was something you could not take in the legal system. 
You could not take someone's tunic. You could take it for a time period, but you would always have to return it to them at night. In fact, one commentator wrote this, a cloak or outer robe, the, the, the tunic, was indispensable for living in Palestine. So even if you lost your shirt or tunic in court and your opponent asked for your cloak, I meant your cloak, they couldn't take the cloak, and won it, he had to return it every evening for you to sleep in. That was the law. And this was an actual law of this time that they would have to return that to them. Even if you gave it to them, they'd have to return it to you. So what is Jesus getting at here? What is he saying here? What does this have to do with his teaching on setting aside our own personal perceived need for retaliation? And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Jesus' point couldn't be more precise, especially if we look at that verse in verse 39, to not resist the one who is evil. Because such lawsuits come from a place of evil. Someone wanting to take away absolutely everything someone owns, including the shirt off their back. Jesus tells his followers to simply not just give your tunic, but your cloak as well, the outer garment. So that even whenever someone would attack you unjustly, injustly. And they would do this as a means of hurting you. You would not just give the shirt, but also your cloak. You would give it all. Well, what is that supposed to be about? Paul captures this for us better. When someone would take advantage of you, Paul captures it best in Romans 12, 17-21. Repay no evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil, but overcome evil. Or do, not over, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, don't take matters into your own hands, but trust God. I love this passage, especially when it's like, it's like heaping burning coals on your enemy's head. Has anybody ever just pictured doing that? <laughs> sharing that, Alicia. Because it's one of those things where I can know I've, I've imagined doing that before, but then when we start digging into the truth of this, Alicia, as you were already saying, is it was an opportunity to bless someone, to show them love, to show them mercy, to show them forgiveness when they don't deserve it. I mean, they're coming at you with everything they got. They're trying to take everything away from you. Give them your cloak as well. Give them your cloak as well. Do you want to retaliate? Do you want retribution? Do you want vengeance? Show them love instead. Don't stoop to their level. Instead, love them in their insult. Love them in their robbery of you, even when they would be taking the very shirt off your back. Forgive them in the same way Jesus has forgiven you. This is truly a radical call that Jesus gives us here, and it requires trust. It requires us to trust God, that he has it in his hand. It requires us to let go of our need for retaliation, to live as a living testimony to who Jesus is for others. To say, you know, I don't know what's going on in your life that's causing you to do this to me, but I want you to know that, you know, I do. I, I love you. I care about you as a person. But more importantly, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. It's rather extreme advice for very extreme circumstances. Nevertheless, it is what Jesus calls us to nonetheless. 
Which brings us to those last two examples given to us by Jesus here, which we're going to have to get into next week, of letting go of our presumed right to retaliation. Letting go of that, that law, that lex pilianus, because Jesus, once again, is showing us a much better way and what it means to be his people in his kingdom. And this fifth, I say to you, statement to truly do as Jesus did for us, as Paul captures in Philippians 2, 3 through 8, to do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The question for us now, though, is did Jesus have anything to say to you today? Will his words, the words of God, cause us to live in a very different and radical way than that of this world? Will his words penetrate years of upbringing in our lives and cause us to not just love our neighbor when we like them, but to love our neighbor whenever they are our very enemy? Will it cause us to live as a testimony to who Jesus is and what Jesus has done? Because that is the point of this to point others to Jesus, to give glory to Jesus, to show others who Jesus is by what Jesus has done in our lives, to live in such a radically different way of life that this world would take notice, and the curiosity of them would be perked regarding why. Even more so that others will see a living, breathing example of Christ right in front of their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Amen.